Allison, Martin, John, we're really excited to have you guys um, with us on this um, special kind of look behind the scenes at some of the diving effort that went into the project that was followed by the film uh, No Roses on a Sailor's Grave, uh, in which you guys uh, undertook a, a survey expedition with John um, into the uh, uh, finding of a lost ship from, a, uh, from the D-Day invasion. Uh, so hi guys. Uh, yeah, thanks. Hi, Daniel. Hi, John. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe if you guys want to just give, uh, for those that don't know and haven't seen anything about the film or even possibly followed the campaign before it, um, maybe tell us a bit about uh, who you guys are and uh, and the club that you belong to and how you came to be sort of part of this. Okay. Start off? Yeah, yeah go, go on. on. I'm Martin Davis. Uh, I'm the diving officer of uh, what we know as South Sea Sabaka Club. And South Sea Survival Club's a large diving club on the south coast of England. And we get involved over quite a number of years now. We've been involved with uh, sort of projects uh, looking at uh, numerous wrecks, uh, mainly along the south coast. But over the last four or five years, we've started to dip our toe into the Normandy area. And um, <clears throat> the Normandy area really is rich with a lot of wrecks and a lot of mysteries, and it's quite taken us uh, taken us by storm, really, hasn't it? In yeah. terms of uh, some of the stuff that's over there, and so the uh, yeah, it's some really yeah. good stuff. Yeah, I mean, um, as as Martin said, it's I think our first project along the south coast was to look at some uh, tanks and bulldozers, a site that's been known for well since the seventies, a dive site. Um, but nobody had bothered to look into what types of tanks they were, how they got there, etc. So that was our first dip into the project world. And they turned out to be, um, you know, very significant find, um, very rare, part of the D-Day um, uh, preparations and were lost off a landing craft when it capsized. So that, that sort of then started the journey of, well, let's go on now and find the landing craft and then maybe this one and then look at our other lots and lots of D-Day mm. stuff along the south coast um, because it was, you know, obviously the the starting point for the Normandy campaign. Yeah, one story has really just led to another. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's like just been effortless really in terms of finding another project. Yeah, yeah. It's, one, it's, yeah. one thing has just led to another yeah, yeah. and and more questions come out of every time you find an answer, there's another three questions that come out of it. <laughs> yeah. so I, I, would, I would throw this to, to John now. I would just say like, so John, when you told me and everyone at Go Button about um, the project that you wanted to do, um, I guess at some point it became inevitable that some part of it was gonna be in the water, right? And not in very friendly water. Yeah, yeah, I mean, once I, up with a project and you know I spoke to Patrick about it and then told you about it it was inevitable really that I'd have to get into the sea I mean a shipwreck it's not on land so yeah. what can you talk about that from a perspective of an archaeologist because you are a up until that point you were a land-based archaeologist primarily right yep. so maybe talk to me a bit about what your thoughts are I mean when you made that promise to Patrick and decided to embark on this sort of expedition um what were you thinking in terms of like your your part in the water expedition um honestly when i thought of it all i it was almost kind of separate from from work because i don't know it was more of a personal project more than a kind of i mean it obviously was an archaeological project but in my head it was i'm going to go do this thing for my mate and the fact that i was a archaeologist was kind of the kind of backing i needed to do it but yeah, it was all just kind of something from the heart, really. I wasn't really thinking about the archaeological part of it until then, obviously, I had to get all very serious and crack on properly, you know. For those who are unfamiliar with your story, how much diving experience did you have when you called us up and told us what you decided to do? Yeah, I hadn't done any diving at all. Um, I'd done a bit of snorkeling when I was younger, and I, would have, I always had a passion for water in the ocean. And I think growing up in Britain, I think when you live in Britain, you lose sight of the fact that we are an island, a really small island. And it was only recently when I lived in a huge, um, another massive country 
landlocked in the middle of it that you realise that Britain is just a tiny island surrounded by water. So I was always only ever about half an hour away from the coast, and I still am now. And you wake up and hear seagulls, and you know, it's just all around you all the time. So yeah. Um, Ali and Martin, can you guys um, tell me a little bit about how you got involved in the uh, expedition? Yeah, you're right. Okay. Um, so, as part of our work uh, here along the south coast and and into Normandy, we we uh, had been working with Chris Howlett um, uh, from the he was in the UK Hydrographic Office, but um, has since moved on from there. And he's um, passionate about uh, uh, the Normandy campaign, and uh, so we've worked together to uh, investigate some of the wrecks that he's just a, uh, an expert in all the wrecks along the, uh, the Normandy coast and um, he picked up I think um, from you John um, your request to uh, for help and, and trying to find um, Patrick's ship and uh, because we'd worked with him before he, he passed us, uh, made the connection and uh, that set us on our way, really. I don't remember, actually. I'm trying to remember now. Yeah. John, how did you find Chris? I remember telling Patrick I was going to look for his ship in Normandy, and then I came home a couple of days later, and I, and I just bombarded the next few days of just watching a lot of documentaries about shipwrecks and Normandy shipwrecks especially, and uh, Chris just kept popping up, and he was always the uh, authority on it all. And, and I've seen some of the work he'd done with sonar along the Normandy coast. And it just seemed, I, well, I guess I could have gone off and tried to do all of that by myself, but it, it seemed worth just sending Chris an email saying he wanted to be involved. And luckily for me, he, he was really keen. And then through that, he told me about um, Ali and Martin. And then the team was formed. That's right. Yeah, I'm trying to, yeah, because I remember some of our early Skypes. Um, actually, so uh, not, probably... Um, Ali Martin, you haven't seen it yet. Um, there, there were a number of Skypes, if you guys recall, that we did, and we tried to record them as potentially part of uh, the documenting of of the yeah. expedition. Um, uh, we did keep one uh, with Chris in there, and it, it was interesting to watch it because I, I realized at the time that it, a lot of the work that I had done as as the director and one of the producers of the film was to be alongside John, or I was in the office just going about my work and uh it it kind of sunk in between that and some of the work that he had done with um the families of uh the survivors and some of the uh some of the crew on on 185 um it occurred to me how much um sleuthing john you had to do because um i guess from my perspective the interesting thing is what came to me was oh no one knows anything about this ship its history is gone what a great project but the flip side of that for the guys that have to do the work like john <laughs> stephen fisher oh no one knows anything about this ship it's gone so yeah. how do you even start looking for anything john i'm curious like for for people that um wouldn't really have never done anything like this um can you describe some of the challenges that you face because i mean obviously our first instinct is to get on you know an internet search engine type up whatever we're looking for and then a link will lead to a link will lead to a link and eventually you'll find something. But in the case of 185, I, I remember that even as you were describing the project to me, I was like quickly like looking at it and I was like, well, there really isn't anything even, you know, I'm going 20, 30 pages into the searches. Can you talk a little bit about how one even goes about trying to unearth the clues before you even approach going looking for the thing? Well, I mean, simply it just comes down at the very, very beginning of the whole thing just to you know, endless, relentless searching of the internet to see if anything comes up. Um, and that's pretty much what it came down to. And and there was very little about it. I know there was one website that claimed to have a position of the wreck and you had to pay to see it and all this sort of thing. And I'm not sure how accurate that was. And then there was, there was um, some naval history websites that had a little bit about it, but it was so, um, I wouldn't say lost, but it was definitely forgotten. It was absolutely forgotten. And um, and I, I don't know if that's because so many people died on the ship and that Patrick was seemingly the only person left. Um, and it took him so long to talk about it. But, you know, after the initial 
researching of it all, I, I, I struck gold with Stephen really and getting into the archives and all that sort of thing because he just uncovered an absolute minefield of great um, information about the ship. And I think the, the thing with the whole project in terms of research and the archaeology and all that sort of thing was time was so much of the essence. And, you know, like eventually I could have got around to go into the archives and if I'd, you know, taught myself how to do it, like Stephen knows, I could have obviously turned up that stuff as well. But the, the fact was, I needed people to work with me to do it because I can't do literally everything. And I already had so much on my plate. And Stephen is an absolute expert at that stuff as well. I mean, he's far superior than I am. So he turned up some absolutely amazing stuff and, yeah, just went from there, really. Yeah, I think one of the things that really struck me personally, and then we tried to embed that in everything we did to, to sort of tack on to what you just said of timing of the essence. I mean, we're very lucky that today, Patrick, as of the recording of this, is still with us. But, you know, almost three years ago when we started talking about this, and definitely two years ago when we were starting to plan the actual expedition, um, we all, I remember we kept having conversations about, you know, if if we're so lucky to complete this and Patrick can be part of it, if it's so lucky that we could complete it and Patrick could even physically be somewhere with us during any of the making of it. And then, Ali, I remember you and I went back and forth a lot over that because we were trying to rush permits and things like that and permissions where I know in your world, these kinds of things might take quite a few months and years to set up. And we kept just sticking with this whole like, well, for Patrick, for Patrick. And, and realistically, um, I think I, I hear what John is saying now. It's like, there's two ways of going about something like this. One is a very academic sort of almost um, uh, clinical. clinical way almost. Yeah, where you're like, okay, well, it'll take five or six or 10 years, but we will eventually find, figure out all the pieces. Um, or um, we can give it a really good first stab and we hit, we hit, we miss, we miss. <laughs> but at least we're churning up the muck and we're gonna see what we could find. And I think we all went with the latter. Um, and uh, it's funny because as the guy sort of following it with a camera, and I'm sure John felt the same, at least I remember those conversations, it felt like it took forever to get anything done. And I know you're I laughing. The French. I know you're <laughs> laughing because I remember the emails with you, Al, you're like, I just don't even know if I can get the French authorities to respond to an email in that time length, right? Yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to get a project generally permission to dive in, in French waters? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have to submit an application with all the plans, all the risk assessments, all the, you know, uh, detail by the 1st of December to do a project the following summer. So, um, uh, you're looking at a good six months you're advance. looking at, at that and then we have to have finished the project by the first of december so the following year so, oh, wow. so uh, it it it's quite a window to operate in um and you really don't know that the permission's coming until you know sort of two March. Weeks before. yeah two, <laughs> if you remember rightly it was I think it I was do. very close to when we yeah. were going so uh it's always a bit of a um a tense time but now that we've done we've done four projects uh, over there now, and um, we've even been invited onto the French survey ship, so we're accepted. We're, we're, we're um, highly regarded, and, and in fact, they they do recommend uh, Cecile at um, Drassum does actually pa uh, pass people our way um, if they're wanting to do some projects with English people. Or just that. more information. Or more information. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we've, we've won friends and influenced people and uh, <laughs> uh, we're part of the Drassen family now, I would say. <laughs> doesn't I, mean we get any special treatment necessarily, <laughs> but uh, yeah. we still have to follow the same rules. But yeah. it is. A, I think the timeline is the thing that's interesting because it occurred. It occurs to me as we're speaking now that at the time we were all in the middle of everything. Plus, everybody has their own life to go through. And I remember at the time John was still at his his uh, previous job. So I just I just remember a constant daily emailing back and forth with like, "Can we book a hotel?" John's like, I think John was like, "Should I take the t like? Are we taking the time? Are we going? Are we not going? Like, what are we doing?" And it was all down to like, when will that email come in from the French authorities? Um, so I think that is maybe one big difference that people should take away from the behind the scenes of this trip is that 
whatever you think of the film when it's out, um, this is my perspective. I'd love to hear what John thinks. We got to look at it through the lens of this was done to try and capture it within the time that we had Patrick with us. And mm -hmm. if we were lucky that everything fell in place, that'd be great. But if not, it was more about bringing the story back up from the murk, uh, the murky kind of depths of history. And uh, I think at the time I was probably blinded by like, well, no matter what happens, we can make it work. But then when you get into the legalities of diving and the logistics of weather and boats and all that, it's, <laughs> it's very much you're at the whim of whatever is thrown at you. Uh, John, what did you, you think about all that? Because I don't know if you remember, if you think back and you remember to those two months when we were trying to keep pushing that dive trip. Yeah, I remember it was incredibly stressful. I mean, like you say, I was still working. I was uh, full time as in, you know, and doing the project at the same time. And I used to work... Uh, it was about 60 hours a week in archaeology and then I come home and uh, then because you're in Canada so then we do all the work at night and I remember when uh, my ex-boss is, is watching this then sorry about this but I used to dig my holes um, at work and then you know take phone calls at the bottom of them <laughs> try and sort out this other project and I mean I was lucky because they were really supportive um, I mean really supportive I couldn't have asked for more of them but yeah it was, inc it was incredibly stressful but like you said, I mean, yeah, we probably were blinded by the whole thing. But I'm not, I'm not sure that's necessarily a bad thing because I feel like it, it enabled us to really kind of knuckle down and, and smash yeah. through it. Um, because, yeah, I mean, as we all know now in hindsight, Patrick is still with us and may keep going on for years to come. Hopefully it does. But, you know, when, when people see the film, I think it really captures that essence of you know, it was this short moment in time where we just really, really went for it. Um, and I feel like that, that created something special with, with the film and, and the project. Um, and the, the funny thing about it is that since, you know, that ended and I've had time to, you know, do more of the project at my own speed. I mean, I've probably uncovered more about LCH 105 since the project than I ever did before or during <laughs> the project, just because I've had the time to do it you know, without any other stresses and to actually, you know, email people and go to the archives myself and all sorts of stuff. But I mean, I, I like, I like the fact that it's a bit rushed. It's a bit hectic. I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's me in a nutshell. And I think that's you as well, Daniel, from everything I've yeah. learned in the last few years. So. Well, and I think Ali and Martin, I'm curious what you think, but from our perspective as producers in a production company, I mean, we do a lot of television in the world of, of factual. Um, and sometimes that, juggernaut of tv and everything behind it can sometimes force things to play or lubricate some wheels and and gears to make museums open doors faster and not with the french though it didn't well, but, yeah but but the thing is you know I, I think i agree with john that's that that energy kind of kept it pushing forward and got us probably more than we would have gotten if we'd said right let's do the clinical thing lay it out as a project 10 years you know, Patrick's here, great. Patrick's not, great. It's bigger than him. Uh, I think the urgency and this, the relationship between John and Patrick, and then because of that, I think when you see the film, you'll see that everyone else's relationship becomes about Patrick, and it stops becoming about a ship, a dive, a memorial, a, yeah. an archive. It just becomes like, here's this great man, and he's great not because he's a great man, but because he's just this awesome guy that like I think any one of us that's gotten to know him can just call him a friend now, which is an unusual relationship that even John had to kind of explain in the early days. Was like, what have you got to do with a 90 something year old guy who's not a family member? And I think that sort of embedded in everyone and there's statements from each of you in the film um, who only knew Patrick for a day at that point in person. I met him until the, the time. Completely yeah. enamored with him and that kind of rejuvenated the, or sorry, re-energized the project I should say and, and Kind, I think it kind of made us do things not not we never crossed the unsafe barrier, but I do believe that it made us do things faster and more like let's round out this edge, but just get her done. And I, I agree with John about that one. Uh, and I think the one big thing we hit, um, and I'm grateful for Drasim uh, for letting us do it. But I think the one big snag that we hit is like right, you're diving a wreck in the French waters. And that is a legal issue. So you're just not going to weekend snorkel out there on your own. <laughs> on that note, I kind of wanted to pivot to asking John um, how 
you, there was a timeline issue also with you being prepared for it, right? Because it's one thing to say, okay, we're going to set a date of July 31st and we, or, you know, we're going to go dive, but you needed to get a license, right? You needed to get a diver's license and you needed to be also qualified beyond just the paperwork. So can you describe a little bit? I mean, I know throughout your social media, we managed to follow a little bit of your adventure, but that's actually a part that's missing from the film because we didn't have a lot of access. Um, and I think anybody watching it would be like, you know, it'd be great to, to fill in that gap. Like, how does John go from like, I snorkeled when I was younger to like in a full on 03 wetsuit, you know, jumping off a, a rickety little dinghy. Pardon me, because I was up to here in my water on second day. <laughs> <laughs> Your boat uh, yeah. in the middle of, of, you know, the English Channel. Yeah, it, I mean, it was a whirlwind. Um, it all seems quite hazy when I look back at it now, I suppose. But I... Um, yeah, I started going to dive school in the evening after work, um, and it was at a it was at a, an all girls boarding school after after hours. So it was just this huge like mansion near Ipswich, which obviously Dan, you don't know where Ipswich is, but it's a place in England. So I had to kind of drive an hour every uh, I think it was once a week or something like that. But I learned in this little swimming pool, and yeah, I mean it was really fun. I remember it being. Um, cold in the swimming pool because I was just learning in trunks you know and so that was that was an experience and then we had like classroom lessons and stuff and then I went and learned did my open water dives in a, a quarry in Leicester which is where I went to university actually but um, hang on I'm googling that one as well Ipswich and yeah there we go well you'd, you'd probably pronounce it Leicester or something but it's well you guys <laughs> always end up adding like six different syllables and something it doesn't mean but uh, yeah. By the way, just for reference, that was still in the fall winter, right? That was still cold. That was not. Yeah, it was freezing. Not that diving. And uh, actually, I, I I remember to jump forward, but it wasn't until we were in Normandy that I learned from Allison with the next seal of a dry suit, you have to roll it in with yeah. or something. And no one had told me that I'd done twenty-five dives up until that point. Twenty of them were in a dry suit. Not one person had told me that that was the reason that every time I dived, it would fill to the brim with freezing cold water. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so it was December, I think, and it was in this quarry, and it was incredibly grim, and the dry suit leaked every single time. Um, and then after that, I thought I'd treat myself, so I went and did my advanced open water in um, Malta, in the Mediterranean. Although it's still February, so it wasn't exactly mm. boiling hot. It was still quite cold, but yeah, and then I did a bit more in, in Stony Cove, the quarry, and, and yeah, and then I was prepared. So yeah, it was the 25th dive that I did the Normandy one. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ali, Martin, talk a little bit about what are the conditions of the site that we went diving. What Generally, what is the sea like in that area on a good day and on a bad day? Yeah, well, the, um, the wreck itself is sort of positioned over to the east and that means that you've got a couple of sort of rivers that are influencing the visibility over in that area so uh, we <clears throat> we've got the river Orne basically and the river uh, Bay the, and it's called the Bay the Seine so you've got the river Seine as well which is uh, not quite so much of an influence but it's still pumping in uh, brown water uh, in into that sort of area so in the we, it was really noticeable on the uh, on the low water dive when the river had most influence that the visibility was probably around mm, two meters perhaps at most yeah. um, and there was a layer of yeah. fresh of oh, seawater at the bottom and the fresh water on the sitting top, on the top of the river yeah. um, yeah. so and then you know when the high water actually came in and had sort of much more influence on the rivers then uh, the visibility, you know, certainly improved. And I think we perhaps had, on the best day, we perhaps had five meters. Five or six, yeah. Um, but in general, it's very bitty, the water. So you, you haven't got this clarity that you would sort of see as in the Mediterranean or maybe somewhere in uh, Canada, perhaps, where they have some nice clear water over there, don't you, I think, sometimes? They, they, they do, yeah, yeah, we well, should know, Daniel, actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Shipwreck Alley and all that. So, um, yeah. So the Bay of Seine, it, it's it's definitely has its challenges, and uh, and just getting out from the harbour out to the out to the actual wreck site. Um, you know, the 
the influence of the uh, of the English Channel really and the sea and the weather you know can be quite quite challenging you know we we've certainly been out there in some times when you think I wish we weren't out here uh, and you know you can easily get a two or three meter swell sometimes which uh, you know can make it quite unpleasant especially you know we're not in the biggest of boats around so you know it, it's it's a challenge you know it really can be a challenge and it, I would say in some respects it's not for the faint-hearted sometimes you know and you know probably as John as a new diver um, probably had a lot of uh, uh, maybe a little bit of anticipation there about what was coming your way <laughs> so, yeah you know so we've got wind currents tides um, visibility, visibility it, it, it's all in the equation and it's all got to come together you know to make you know to come people come out and say we had a great dive then something really special has actually <laughs> happened you know <laughs> all those four elements have come together in, a, in the right way as they should do I was just going to interject one other thing that you forgot to add that was specially placed just for John's dive. And that's a whole bunch of fish hooks um, that we, we ordered specially from some random <laughs> fishing boat that decided, can you, John, can you tell us when you found that out? I think we, I think we were on the boat when they told us that. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty late. Um, and I, even then I thought it was probably, I mean, I go fishing with my dad sometimes and the hooks are like this big. <laughs> and the, the line were pretty big. Uh, but that just adds to it. I've told that story a good few times at the pub now. It's all part of the experience. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, this was your first non-shore dive, right? Yeah, first time I ever dived out of a boat. Yeah, and can you, because, you know, that's, I've, I've done a lot of diving in my life, not like these guys, but I've done a lot of diving and filming underwater, so I've done both. But can you describe the difference of how that, what were you thinking, and how is that actually different? Um, yeah, it's completely different, really, from what I found. And every morning I'd go and roll myself. I don't know if anyone knows this. I'd go and roll myself off the back of the swimming pool we had at the accommodation um, into the water to try and practice. So I must have looked like a maniac if anyone was kind of peeking in. But, um, but yeah, it's totally different. Every, every short, like Stony Cove, you just jump off the, the side. And then yeah. at Malta, we just I kind of went in from the shore, literally off the nice sand or the nice rocks and stuff. So... When we were out in that little dinghy, um, it was crazy, really. I mean, I've been braced on how to roll back. and That was the okay bit. Getting back in was uh, the hard bit, really. <laughs> quite something when you've, I mean, there's no way you can practice that before you're in it. So <laughs> that was really a kind of very, very intense experience. It sounds, it sounds like it wouldn't be significant to anyone that hasn't been in that situation, but it was wild. I mean, there were so many people kind of, helping me or shouting at me in a nice way to, to tell me what to do and stuff and it's really hard trying to get yourself into that boat especially when you've never done it before so that that was an experience and then obviously I suppose as a side point was you know not with it not being a shore dive I was so far so much further out normally so it was the first time I'd ever dive where you could you know completely surrounded by the ocean it, you know, either you see it in a movie or you might have done some scuba diving in a nice Caribbean resort where they, you know, there's like three people on the boat that their only job is to get you in and out of the water. Here's your flippers, you know, all that. They'll take your mask when you're off the ladder. Uh, I mean, ladder, that's luxury, right? And then, and then I remember because I did it with you. Um, and I, and I've, I've done this before and it was still not easy for me. I, I felt very uh, at the whim of the sea. Um, you guys do this daily, so it must feel different. But I felt, John, I'm curious what you think. I felt like, okay, your head bobs up. And it, we should add, you're after an hour dive. So you're tired. You're tired, you're cold. I'm assuming there's also a bunch of emotions because this was you on the wreck. And I, I had a bunch of emotions because I was like, yeah, got it. All right, we did it. I got it. Okay, we got that thing out of the way. We can, we can move on and film. Um, and then you pop up, your head pops up. And it's very different when you've reached the surface because even though you're starting to see the sort of you know, slightly more visible, but, but slashy water at the top when you're going up the, the rope. Uh, it's not until you break surface that you see the conditions on, on the water and suddenly the dinghy's like, <laughs> <laughs> suddenly this tiny dinghy, which we were all making fun of, is like a mountain to get up. Um, mm -hmm. and even once they've liberated you of your dive tank and of my camera, I, just like, I just feel like a whale trying to get up on this thing. And uh, I don't know, I felt... Um, I think the thing that got me up easily was 
one, I'm not going to embarrass myself. <laughs> two, <laughs> two uh, the longer I stay here, the more tired I'm going to get, the harder it's going to be to get in this boat. So you got to muscle up the last little bit. And thank God there were like three guys, like John was saying, to haul you in. But I think for anybody who's never done that, the difference between, a, you know, a, I won't say casual, but a, a shore dive, even for a wreck um, with a dive instructor is night and day. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The the time spent on the wreck in the water, that was the, uh, that was easy. That was a walk in the park because I prepared for that. I trained for that for months. But, you know, the actual, the surface is the tough bit. It was at least on that day. It was absolutely insane, really. And you're right, you, your head, I mean, it's literally a split second between being underneath that water and being above it. And the difference in, in just chaos is <laughs> hard to kind of quantify, really. It's a, a different world once you were on the surface. You immediately want to be back down there at peace again, I suppose. It was interesting because uh, Ali and Martin, you mentioned that on the two previous dives uh, when I was, uh, one, I was out with you on the boat and the other one I remember talking to you about afterwards. Um, where you guys both described how much better it is to be down there, not just as part of your job and your passion and also the love of diving, but also it's just so much more relieving once you're out of the boat and in the water. Can you talk yeah, about that in his experience? Being shaken around yeah. and bobbed around. <laughs> as soon as you get below the surface, mm -hmm. the, the You're in a calm, safe environment. Yeah, basically. The calm, you know, you're focused, you're going down the line and you've got the job to do, but you stop all this random, you know, juggling you around. And the, yeah, the yeah. best thing you can do is get below the surface. Yeah, you're in control. Conditions but, uh, like that. And, then, you know, a, a lot of incidents actually do happen when people just break the surface because they're not, you know, they're, they're potentially not prepared for what's, what's going to hit them because the sea can just change so quickly uh, in that hour that you're down there. You know, one minute it can be flat calm, next minute it's whipped up and, you know, it's a, like you say, a challenge to get back in the boat. And so a lot of incidents do actually occur on the surface. And we always say to people, get down as quick as you can, because you, you get into that safer environment that you're, you're more familiar with, really, you know. John, I don't remember if I asked this to you when we were there, but it, it just occurred to me now, years later. Um, does that give you any perspective on what some of the sailors might have encountered when they're being thrown overboard in some of these sinking situations? I mean, we were there with a super, you know, prep dive team, advanced motorboat, um, you know, all the gear in the world to basically survive in the water in the event that you're not in the boat. Um, you know, at the very worst, you just lay back on your back, inflate your BCD a bit and, you know, just let the ocean do what it does. But I mean, I, I got a real good sense of the power of the British, you know, of the English Channel um, on that day. And I was fully supported. Like I knew I wasn't in any danger, really. Can you imagine what it's like at night? when your boat, I mean, sailors aren't supposed to be in the water, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I never thought of that, I suppose. Yeah, it de definitely gives you a kind of appreciation for how bad that would have been. Um, because when Patrick went into the war on that day, he, he obviously didn't have a life jacket on it, and he had a big pair of leather boots. Um, so that is absolutely horrendous. And yeah, like you say, the sea, the English Channel on that day, and I suppose it gets a lot worse than that as well, was... Um, brutal it was absolutely brutal so yeah horrible horrible to think really but I mean maybe it gave us a chance to kind of experience that in a controlled environment and have a different appreciation for it than we would have done otherwise I think it's easy to read stories about ships sinking and people going into the water and you know not really taking the time to comprehend what that actually means and I mean no better way than actually experience it firsthand although yeah. we were lucky to get out at the end of it obviously Martin, on, on a trip like this, or Ali, something always goes wrong. Without giving away too much of what might have gone wrong, for those that haven't seen the film yet, just, you get, what, what kind of planning goes into, I mean, you guys had it down to like, I remember the sheets that you sent me, and I guess John had seen the report as well before, like even just the, the plan that you submitted. I was like, wow, this is more detailed than anything I've done even on a film production, where it's like, it's down to the minute, like, here's when the tide comes in, here's where we're in the water, and if not, we can't. Yeah, we, uh, well, we, I, you know, we plan to the nth degree uh, in terms of how the timings need to happen. And uh, I, I guess in some respects, it's good for, for you if you're actually filming because you can see exactly at what moment we're going to be doing a certain activity. Um, but it has to be like that because 
the sea and the tide is unforgiving, you know, and it, it's ruthless, really, you know. So if you don't get it right, then, you know, you either don't dive or the dive goes wrong. Um, and through our huge experience that we've got, you know, we, we have learnt, you know, the hard, way. <laughs> the hard way sometimes, you know, that you have to just plan to the nth degree. Um, and then you plan for some alternatives if, if, if X happens, you know. Um, so we've always generally got a backup plan. Uh, but, you know, the way we run the diving these days is, is pretty smooth and we're, we've, we've got on top of those tides, uh, certainly in the Bay of Seine. Again, they are, they are <laughs> unforgiving, are they really? Yeah, but uh, they, you could have, you know, equipment failure or you could have someone with a, um, um, uh, some sort of incident underwater that yeah. you then have to deal with. So you have to plan for all the rescue scenarios um, and make sure you've got all the safety equipment um, that you need, oxygen, whatever that might yeah, be, yeah. and that people know how to phone the Coast Guard, how to or radio the Coast Guard and, and how to deal with a casualty. If you know. So it's not just the planning for the actual activity, you've got to plan for all these other events that might happen yeah. um, because it's, it could be somebody's life, you know, at the end of the day. And there's a, there's a lot of things on a, on a big project like you know, the sort of thing we do, you know, you might have 10 people on board um, <clears throat> in terms of the people in the project and you know, everything has got to work, basically. So, you know, not only the people's equipment, you know, we obviously make sure it's all serviced and fully operational, but, you know, then we've got actual, we need to make sure that people work as well. So, you know, we need, we need everybody fully functioning. So, you know, one member drops out or has an accident and something goes wrong, then, you know, we're a team member down. And, and so, you know, we have to sort of plan for contingency of that as well. So there's there's a lot of things that have to come together to make it all work like clockwork, like it does generally. So. Hopefully, <laughs> but if it doesn't, you, you know what to do and yeah. you know how to deal with it. Yeah, John. In in other kinds of archaeology, I guess it isn't. Um, or maybe it is. Uh, maybe it comes down to like rental of special equipment or something. But I'm trying to imagine other scenarios where it feels like to survey something for 40 minutes to an hour, you need to do you know, triple, quadruple, sometimes even more I don't know, preparation, but work just to get to it. Like you said, getting suited up, getting to the dinghy, getting out into the sea, finding the spot, tying to the anchor, tying to the, uh, the line, getting in, being safe, going down, coming back up, and then the whole journey back. And then all that is for the 40 to 50 minutes that you've got under there in the Merc. John, is there anything else like that in, that you can imagine in, in your experience in archaeology, or is this a pretty unique thing? No, yeah, you wouldn't. You wouldn't really do that on the land. I think the archaeology of underwater and land-based, the actual archaeological aspect of it is, you know, by and large, exactly the same. But it's the, it's everything that goes into the diving that that makes that such a different kettle of fish. I mean, ultimately, surveying anything is the same principle, but you just don't have all the worries on land that you do in the water, which obviously is the extreme environments and everything that Alison and Martin have said. Which is why, you know, so few people do it, I suppose. A lot easier to recall something on land. Well, and I imagine also a lot cheaper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess the other thing is though that when you're you visit the site, um, quite often, you know, land things, it's it's land and below, isn't it? It's it's, it's digging. But actually yeah. when we visit a site, um, particularly if it's a well preserved wreck it's it, it's in its total 3d and it is um uh, quite often even these days you know it's covered in marine life um but you can see the structure you can see what it was it looks like hopefully a wreck you know and you, you're looking for those key identifying parts that you can then help identify the the wreck itself or you know or or dis count the wreck um yeah i mean maybe, maybe it's the, maybe it's a case of kind of high risk high return because like you say the yeah. the wreck is already there you can by and large unless it's under the sill and stuff but by and large it's it's there and it's all its glory whereas with that land archaeology is a very slow it can be a very slow tedious backbreaking um <laughs> process to reveal something that might not even be there so i suppose it's different in yeah. that sense as well 
and I, and I assume also with land archaeology, there's always the risk of damaging it when you're revealing it, right? But you can't go around it until you've revealed it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, thinking about it, the archaeology, like I say, the survey and all the technique and stuff is pretty much the same. But yeah, there's a lot of differences, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, for one, once you dig, once you dig down, normally you take it out. Um, but you don't take the wreck out most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I've got to say, when we first did all the press for it, a lot of people ran with that, thought we were lifting the wreck out of the... Uh, oh, yeah. it was, I don't know how much money they thought I had, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, the, the other beauty is you can, uh, in, in land archaeology equivalent, you can fly around it because you've got sure. that movement in three, three dimensions, which means you don't have to touch it. You can, you can appreciate it other than, you know, a tape measure, which in yeah. itself, a bit of tide is a bit of a battle. But um, yeah. uh, you can, you know, swim around the wreck uh, without disturbing it at all. Right. Uh, and still understand and appreciate it, photograph it, but however you may want to um, record it. Right, and you, you guys, um, I'll lead into something for John in a second with you guys. I'm curious, like, what, um, everything you've described, now I've been there, so I know why, but for people to watch this, we'd probably ask themselves, why on earth do you do this? <laughs> because I can't imagine the additional expense for the gear you guys have to dive the conditions you do, because I know for a fact that if I just go diving in a three quarter shorty, three mil suit in the Caribbean, minus the $200 flight or wherever I'm trying to go, uh, it's cheap. pretty easy going. Just, you know, pretty fish, some wrecks. I could see all the way to Mexico. It's great. <laughs> and yet you guys are doing something that effectively is difficult, physically challenging, and sometimes dangerous beyond normal diving recreational danger. Uh, why do you do that? Question. Good question. I think uh, for myself, it's been um, a sort of journey of, uh, again, evolving journey, probably. Of, uh, you know, I've been diving for a long, a long time now, so um, I need something more than just going for a dive. And I've sort of decided that I started off, I would start by doing photography, and then I've sort of stemmed into sort of video stuff more recently. Um, and then I can combine those with um, a project of actually, you know, going and actually doing something now. And then taking that into another level, then, you know, with the photography, we can then start creating 3D models. And it's for myself, you know, I need that bit of a challenge just to sort of keep me going. And if it's a bit more difficult, then I just find a way of uh, overcoming that difficulty to, to get the results, you know, basically. So, Link's a bit different for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, for me, every time we visit a wreck, and, and certainly the ones we've done in Normandy, they haven't been what we thought we were. They were. Um, and for me, it's the story that comes with a wreck. Um, how did it get there? What's the story? What type? Of, what was it doing? you know, and the people that were part of that incident, um, very often then that, that story isn't told or known. And it, for me, it's about finding out exactly what happened. And we're what some of the few people who can visit this place. Um, and then I think we have it's almost like a duty to then share that story, what we found, what we've seen, how how that can then be uh, told and shared with people who never go underwater, never never have heard that story. So for me, it's um, my sort of wreck detective. <laughs> I love that uh, Martin will tell you. I like Clark crime stories and the sort mysteries. of the yeah. mysteries and the finding out of things. And um, just about every wreck that we've done. Um, in the 10 or more projects that we've, we've uh, carried out has had that mystery exposed um, and shared and, you know, the, a recognition of um, what that ship and its part mm -hmm. in perhaps the Normandy landings or whatever it might have been um, gets told. And we've tended to do the smaller things, so not the big, well-known um, uh, you know, capital ships, as we would call them um, in the Navy. 
um, that you know grab the headlines that are movies. This is the smaller, the landed craft, the tugs, the minesweepers, all of these other um, types of uh, ships and vessels that um, you know were essential um, in in that whole campaign. But like John said earlier, their story's been lost. It's um, it's a case of for me sharing that with people who never go diving, yeah. never have heard of, you know, the Battle of Normandy and uh, and just recording that so that in the future that that story remains live. Do you find that, John, um, true from a perspective of a, a historian and an archaeologist? Um, people tend to, or at least maybe the general public tends to, um, affix itself to the bigger stories, the bigger dramas, whereas Patrick's story is, it's a personal small story. I mean, everyone had a moment in World War II. Everything was important. But Stephen once said something to me, Stephen Fisher, who we keep referencing, our, our archivist and our researcher, um, he mentioned that at some point people were deal people looked at landing craft as just sort of like essential canoes to get across the channel. And so on a day where you lose a sub, a command ship, a fast boat, you know, so four landing craft go down, it's, I don't know, what do you think, John? Yeah, I mean, I think people definitely kind of take a bigger interest in the, the bigger stories. And that's why I was so keen to do this one, because I love an underdog story. And uh, Patrick and LCH 105 was, you know, the greatest underdog story you could write, really. And I, they, to me, and I guess to all of us, Patrick's story is representative of all of those land and craft and all of those men and all of those sailors. Um, and I, I guess you're right, yeah, at the time they didn't think much of it, but now as those veterans have gone down in numbers massively and and obviously the wrecks have deteriorated, it's kind of uh, brought a new importance to them that maybe it wasn't there in the past. And that's why it's so important to, to tell. And I love the chance to do a British story as well, because I think, I mean, I mean, this isn't, you know, a dig at all because I did it when I first got into history and stuff like that. You know, I watched Band of Brothers and Private Ryan and all that sort of thing, and, you know, took a huge interest in it. And, and that was kind of the vessel to get me to take an interest in our own country's war history. Um, but I think perhaps, you know, not enough people carry on and find out what happened with the British and the Canadian as well. And, and it was a great chance to raise awareness of that and, and to have Patrick there as well as a bonus. And did you find, um, Ali, Martin, that was there any point where you sort of transitioned from dive team with the job to finding yourself caught up in a story? I don't even mean the film. I just mean the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I think that was fairly soon. On. We do get, well, maybe me more than you, <laughs> we do get um, drawn into the emotion of it um, and that was very easy to do once we heard about Patrick and John and John's promise um, it, it was very easy to get drawn into that and, and actually we haven't there's only one other project where uh, we've met um, either veterans or veterans families and that really does bring another dimension when you either see the photographs of the people who were lost at the time, um, or you then meet their fiance, their, their wives, their um, uh, brothers and sisters and that mm. sort of thing. And, and you know, with, with Patrick, um, it, it was a real honor to, um, to finally meet him when we were over there and, and uh, just buy into the story mm. uh, a bit more. Yeah, I, I find it's uh, it's yeah, it's it's probably I start off looking at the project and what we need to do, but I, I do tend to get drawn in as well. So, uh, and the more you dig into the research and you get that sort of human connection, um, then you know it can get quite emotional sometimes in terms of you know these these people died and then you suddenly bump into a relative. Um, who never knew perhaps you know and yeah it's it, the more i think i think the 
what we do with a lot of our projects, they, we do dive very deeply into some of them, uh, more so than a, uh, maybe a company would who was just doing a standard job. And I think that's the difference you yeah. get with us is we really do dig down for the truth. And, uh, and it does draw you in, definitely. Yeah. You definitely get drawn in and you, know, you, get, a, you get a connection to it. Um, and, and you know, Patrick was there as well for this particular one. So it makes it, yeah. most of the time, you just see a photograph of somebody, but you know, when you meet a real person, that's fantastic. You know, yeah. It really is true. It was so fantastic. lovely too. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I'm I'm thinking back to other diving experiences I've had and realizing that I I had always thought wreck diving was another fun thing to do in environments that I usually go diving, which tends to be either the Caribbean or the Mediterranean, sometimes in Canada and Fresh Lakes. And um, yeah, I've always been one of those people that wants to know a bit more about the wreck, but I never had any sometimes I just find myself for the 40 minutes or odd that I'm down there just really enjoying the process and the, it's almost like a rock climbing or something. It's like you're navigating a wreck, right? And you're trying not to disturb it and you're doing your best to, to be, you know, a careful good diver, but um, you're not really associating with the wreck. Um, and I'm curious if John, you felt different. I know the whole journey of diving for you was built for that moment. But even throughout your 20 something dives before, at some point it must have also been fun, challenging, just, just a scuba dive. It was just a scuba dive, right? And this is just a wreck. And I know you're a historian and I've seen, you know, on all your social media, there's almost nothing, whether it's music or history that you don't want to know the story of and you usually post a good little sentence about it. But at some point you're kind of removed from whatever you're diving. And then there was that dive you did in Normandy. And I'm curious, if you have, if you can look back now and see the difference between how you felt diving leading up to the wreck emotionally, right? And then being down there that one time you get to go to something that was a project that you were attached to. It had nothing to do with just a wreck dive. It was a strange one really, because I mean, when I started the whole thing, it, it was all kind of very, I don't know, I wouldn't use the phrase gung-ho, but it was very kind of, I'm gonna go do this thing. It was very kind of like early 20s, right? And I um, think you can take on the world, which, you know, we did. But I think going into it, it was kind of this idea of dive this wreck, do this thing, come home, you know, tell the world about it. But everything that came with it after that was so kind of, and you must have found this as well, Daniel, when we were both making the film t together, it was difficult to because we were both within the project and with, you know, outside of it. And so one minute it was incredibly emotional. And then on the other hand, you had to think of it from a logistics point of view all the time. And it was kind of battling with those two things. And that was the whole thing with the, the dive and the wreck, I think, because when I started, it was just a wreck and I, I knew there was a chance it could be down there and that my mate Pat had been on it. But then along the way, I saw photographs of people who died on the ship I spoke to relatives, I spoke to a woman whose father died in that sinking and she's still alive and we were chatting and there was one photograph I remember of one of the sailors and the only image I have of it is it's got a massive glare because it's in a frame and the reason it's on, in a frame is because it's still on his sister's uh, mantelpiece um, and he's still missing, right? Obviously, she's not around but in her head she was still hoping that one day you, know, you might find out some information about it. And so those kind of moments, and there was a lot of them behind the scenes, those moments kind of built up and built up and built up. Um, so by the time I got down to the wreck itself, my kind of feelings about the whole thing um, changed massively. And I remember um, swimming along and, and it was a weird feeling because whether or not, you know, it was a target that we were investigating, but still all the weight behind it was so huge. and. I had a feeling of kind of, I don't know if I should actually be down here because I, I knew so much more about it now. And I knew that, I knew the faces of the men who probably had ended up down there and I knew the relatives of those men. And it was all, it was a very strange feeling, one that it's hard to describe and one that I think very few people will ever feel because it's such a unique thing. But yeah, I just remember being down there and just questioning the whole thing really, um, which, yeah, I don't know why. And 
I don't really question it anymore. I was glad we did it, obviously, but um, I don't know. It was just, it was strange. I've never been able to put my finger on it. It still kind of keeps me awake at night sometimes. Just this idea of being down there and, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was weird, but I don't is know it, if Alison and Martin have ever had that. Or... Is it because, um, I felt that way for a brief second, but I was really busy as well. Um, is it because... I almost had a moment where I thought like you, not you don't deserve to be here, but there's a very, there's an, every other war site I've ever been to or site of a tragedy tends to have been cleaned of anything that is related to humans, right? And then it's usually a memorial and what's left. And then occasionally yeah. like with certain, you know, concentration camps and other places I've filmed at or visited, there's, there's that little bit of, this is still exactly the way it was that makes it really eerie and, you feel almost, not just humbled, you feel almost unworthy. Um, with the wreck, I felt almost the same thing because I felt like regardless of what wreck you're diving, someone lost their lives or potentially many people lost their lives on that. And it's not been, the sea has taken it over. It's now a marine life. Ali pointed that out really nicely. It's now a place of life and peace, but it's still got the echoes of that pain and that anguish that's never been resolved because nobody's been able to say goodbye because sometimes people don't know the end. And maybe that's what you're talking about. Cause I, I had a brief moment where I felt like here I am, you know, using all the technology in the world to make a film and follow a project. There's people that actually died here. Nobody ever got to stick it by. Right. I don't know if Ali, if Martin, if you guys ever feel that in you, cause it is a job, right. Or, or a, a hobby that's a job that's got an important, but it may, I don't know if that's, if that's sort of what you guys feel once in a while. There's um I know Martin, you can sometimes be very logistical about it, and Ali, you're very emotional about it sometimes. But I, I don't. Well, know. we're perfectly matched. <laughs> yeah. no, well, first, I'm curious, John, did I capture roughly what you were thinking? I just felt like a little bit like this is an. It's like yeah, a, yeah, yeah. That's pretty spot on. I mean, I think um, up until that point, I'd only dived on wrecks uh, that were modern and had been put there by and large for tourism, um, and that's a completely different ball game. So I never really had that emotional kind of attachment to any of these wrecks and uh, when we went down there it was um whether or not it was from the ocean for 70 years or the the germans or the the scrap dealers later on but the wreck that we dived on was in obviously in incredibly bad condition and it was almost strange because when i got down there it was bigger than i'd imagined and it was in better condition than i imagined but then actually when you looked into the the small kind of corners of it it was an incredibly an incredibly bad state and i I think maybe that's what kind of got to me a little bit was um i don't know you get so caught up in thinking oh i'm gonna dive a wreck because that is you know undisputably a cool thing to do diving on shipwrecks there's no ultimately you know i don't care what anyone says they do it because they enjoy it no one's getting in that sea because they hate it um so it's an enjoyable thing and i think perhaps it was it was a wake-up call once i got down there that this was actually potentially the ship that you know this this man that i made friends with the one, you know, that's the ship potentially that he thinks about on those quiet nights, you know, and, and now I'm actually here. And I wouldn't say that I don't deserve to be there. It's just whether or not I should be there, you know, whether it should just be left alone um, and just, yeah, just left to the sea. But obviously we were there to do a job. It's not as bad as we weren't just, you know, messing around, but yeah. But we're, we're some of the few people who can pay our respects. Um, in those sort of conditions um, yeah yeah absolutely I mean yeah I'm all, I'm all for it that's just the um, kind of momentary epiphany I had when I was down there um, but I absolutely you know I'm all for it I think it's it was great that we did it I think it's great that I could just look into Rex obviously I'll do it again um, oh, and you, but, had a, you had a line you had a line in the film that you told me in one of the interviews that you felt like in some ways because Patrick was no longer at the age and in the condition to do it you were a little bit like Patrick's vessel like his submarine and maybe that's what Ali and Martin you guys are describing is that there's a maybe there is a responsibility to remember and you can never quite be sure like you said should should not but at least that was the intent the intent was to say right for for all intents and purposes we're going to go down there with with um the utmost respect and with a camera to say goodbye in some way. I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's what. Yeah. I mean, otherwise they'd never get visited, would they? I mean, it's a bit, 
I, I sort of liken it to um, the same as taking a graveyard or, or a memorial or something like that, um, where um, obviously there's a, a scene, you talked about the concentration camps and things like that, of awful tragedy. Um, but that tragedy is still being remembered by us visiting and it's now quite a beautiful place quite often lots of marine life like in a, a say a graveyard where you might have birds flying um, and insects and butterflies and trees and whatever you have marine life doing exactly the same thing but quite often it's so peaceful in terms of you know it's quiet you can just hover around swim around not disturb anything and it it, it, it can be total switch off it from the whole day life sort of stuff it is another world in in every sense of the word yeah and uh john i i one thing i remember uh i don't know if you've continued to think about it but i do remember that regardless of this particular survey you found a new passion it became a bigger thing for you diving uh can you talk about that a little bit yeah, I mean, I, I I certainly enjoy it. I um I haven't done it much since. I've got to say, I kind of had to walk away from the whole thing for quite a while to um you know regain that sort of passion. But yeah, I, I've slowly started diving again. I, I went back to Malta and I dived some more. Um, and and yeah, I, I mean, it's hard moving forwards with the whole thing because um you know every now and then I start another project, and then it's kind of this dilemma of, you know, have I said everything I wanted to say in that, in that realm? You know, I mean, I said everything I wanted to say about D-Day veterans. I said everything I wanted to say about shipwrecks. And I said everything I wanted to say about archaeology. So it's kind of, I don't know, I kind of wrestled between leaving it as it is and, and getting the old suit back on. I'm not really <laughs> sure. But it's only been a couple of years. We'll see what, what happens, you know. That's the beauty of life, I guess. But I think uh, it sounds to me like, though, given the opportunity, you know, obviously even in a more recreational fashion, that you, you, you didn't, you didn't, um, so there were two two outcomes in my mind that were possible. One is that you would discover diving, you'd do it just to get through it, because I know you're one of those people when you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it. And then that was it, just done. But it felt like you also discovered something that you didn't really quite know up until that point in your life that would be quite um, enjoyable and, and challenging in a good way, right? Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a really great experience. Um, it opened up a whole new kind of world of archaeology to me and it's something that I'll always have in my back pocket and um yeah it was uh, I mean I wouldn't say it was a new passion because I it was almost like I'd always had the passion I just never got around to learning to do it you know I'd always been obsessed with shipwrecks and read a lot about them and um you know been obsessed with the ocean and, and everything down there it's just I hadn't had the opportunity to do it so if, I, if anything it was kind of the um the, the great excuse I needed to finally do it and I uh, I'm very glad I did. I mean, I recommend anyone gave it a go, although it's not for the faint-hearted in the English Channel. <laughs> not the English Channel, anyway. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny because I went scuba diving. Uh, I think I, I sent you guys a picture, right? I sent you scuba diving a couple months later in the Caribbean. And I was like, oh, this is what it's like. <laughs> We're like five minutes difference between being underwater and having a martini on the beach if you want. <laughs> no, there's no separation. we are looking forward to seeing the film, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I think you'll like it. I, will. Yeah. I hope it's... you've been kind. <laughs> been kind? Yes. To you, yes. To Martin, less. <laughs> Chris Howlett? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he's going he's to have to make peace with his own, his own word. <laughs> Uh, no, I I, uh, I do want to wrap up by saying that I'm grateful um, because uh, as a filmmaker, I cross line of like that um, completely objective uh, persona, kind of like you're talking about Rex, uh, where I I don't just go right. Well, that's 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 those are his words or her words. That's their story. And whatever happened happened. Um, we got involved. We got heavily involved. We got emotionally involved. Uh, everybody at Go Button got emotionally involved, and uh, and I'm proud of it. I'm really proud of it. I know there's some ups and downs logistically, emotionally, but I'm proud of it. I think it's a great project, a great thing that John you did for Patrick, and for anyone that can't have a voice now, like Patrick, uh, whether alive or not, 
uh, I don't think I truly appreciated it until it was finished how um, big a deal it is for one small thing. You know, it's a big deal. It's a, it's a piece of history that is now firmly anchored one way or another in video and writing and and that story will live on way past Patrick and probably after the wrecks and probably after people will will say D-Day 200th. Yeah, okay. But there'll be this piece that no one can take away from anyone. And I'm grateful you guys were involved. And I'm grateful everybody navigated all the ups and downs of the ocean and, and the logistics and the paperwork and the time and all that stuff. And I, in some um, strange way, miss doing that. And uh, I know I'm going to visit the uh, memorial again. I did uh, last year when I was shooting something else out there. Uh, I'm, I think it's also brought great new friendships, which something like this does because it's so difficult. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, with Dominic, the mayor, like we talk, which is, is kind of awesome. Um, so I'm grateful. I'm grateful again to John for letting us be part of it and for trusting that it would work out. And I'm grateful for you guys, Allie and Martin and your whole team for putting the time in for, you know, all the gear and, uh, and all that and the work that went into it. And, uh, I'm very excited for people to see the project and I'm very excited for people to, um, hopefully pick up where it left off and, and find other stories and other wrecks, you know, um, on land and Patrick says something very poignant at the end of the film. He says, there's many stories that will be told and some that never will. And I think he says something on land, sea and air. And you as an archeologist and historian, John, you know that intimately and you guys as, as uh, wreck divers for, for these particular projects know that intimately that there's going to be a lot of stories that get forgotten. Um, but the ones that we can keep a hold of, I think they're cool. And I'm proud to have been part of one of those. Yeah. And we're, we're delighted to have been a, able to help help you know and <laughs> thank you john and and daniel for in, inviting us to spark the team because it was lovely to do that patrick and um and to help you keep your promise yeah yeah thanks so much for helping us that's what i like about the story daniel what you say is you know there are so many stories out there still to be told and i think one of the things that i love about our project was that i mean you know, I was a 25 year old that said, well, I'm going to tell this and there's nothing that's going to stop me at all. And, and I hope, I hope other people see that and see that example and, and go and do it themselves because, you know, ultimately, you know, the professors and all that sort of thing. And, you know, the authors and the filmmakers, we can't get around to everything, right? I mean, go and do it yourself, go and, grab your own story, run with it, because the more we can save, the better, right? And we saved one, and maybe we'll save some more.